Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see all your faces in the crowd, and hopefully you've been having a, a good morning so far. We've had some really interesting conversations in the plenary, uh, and I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to have here today. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to read a little bit from my notes. Um, so my name is Jennifer Farah. Uh, I'm director of arts at the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation where we believe in promoting democracy through better informed and more engaged communities. Our focus in the arts program is on the transformative impact that digital technologies have for artists and arts organizations to expand and develop more meaningful connections between people and place, of which Miami, of course, is an important part. And you can't talk about Miami without consideration for the ocean. And I'm enthusiastic that this panel is focused on the ocean. So the ocean is a true love of mine. I recognized early on that proximity and to and connection with the ocean has given me an appreciation for the intricate, beautiful, and critical ecosystems that it harbors. Whether through scuba diving and exploring reefs, or participating in family beach cleanups. The more exposure we have to the ocean, the more cognizant we are about the impact that the deep blue has on our planet, and the more determined we are to participate in its preservation. That is why the art of storytelling through film, the culinary arts, and digital media to share the beauty, diversity, and even mysteries of the ocean is so important. I look forward to the discussion today highlighting the ocean as a climate hero and protagonist in the conversation on climate. So I'm pleased to introduce Michael Conathan, who will moderate the discussion. Michael serves as a senior policy fellow on ocean and climate with Aspen's Energy and Environmental Program. He has worked for many years and in many capacities to preserve and develop the sustainable blue, sustainable blue economy. Welcome, Michael. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, I'm really excited for this panel. This is something that I've been looking forward to since literally the day we started planning Aspen Ideas Climate. Um, I'm, a, as Jen said, I'm a senior policy fellow for Ocean and Climate with Aspen's Energy and Environment Program. Um, and in cultivating a lot of the uh, events that we put together here over the course of these few days, I've, I've really tried to help make sure that the ocean is integrated kind of across all the silos. It, the ocean is often left out of the climate conversation, um, shockingly, given how much of our planet it comprises and how big a role it plays in the climate puzzle. So I really wanted this panel to be our opportunity to dive in, pun intended, to get at all of the, um, the, the amazing things that the ocean does for our climate, for our planet, um, and, uh, and talk about how it can be a source of solutions uh, in addition to or, or instead of the narrative that we usually hear about the ocean and climate change, which is how badly it is faring. And those are true stories, but there are also stories of hope, and that's what we want to focus on here. So I am super excited to, to be joined by these amazing panelists. Um, it's a great, it's like a, it's like a murderer's row of personal connections that are going on up here, which is kind of also really fortuitous and amazing. Um, Colin Ford is the founder and director of Coral Morphologic. He is a, a marine biologist, uh, artist, and uh, musician who grew up um, oddly with my wife in the backwoods of New Hampshire, which we discovered as we went through this process, so that's random. Um, Swati uh, Thyagran Foster is uh, a founder of the Sea Change Project, uh, an environmental journalist, uh, award-winning environmental journalist, and a producer of the Academy Award-winning film My Octopus Teacher. Uh, and at the end, Barton Seaver, um, who needs no introduction if you saw him last night on the plenary stage, um, a recovering chef, a... Um, uh, former National Geographic explorer turned seafood evangelist uh, and a very close friend of mine who lives a little bit up the coast from me in Maine. Um, so these people are amazing. They are going to share with you some incredible stories. They are going to inspire you and they're going to help us unravel why the ocean is left out of the climate conversation and why it needs to be a bigger part of it. So without more of me, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Colin, who's going to give us a presentation yes. of what he does with Coral Morphologic. Go for it. All right. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for, for having me here. So I want to welcome you all to Miami, or as we, through Coral Morphologic, have dubbed the Coral City. Um, and, you know, it's important. We call it the Coral City 
because it has a history, it has a present, and it has a, has a future in which coral is integral to it. And sometimes we forget just how connected the city is uh, to the coral reef here, and also metaphorically how the, the similarities between uh, a city and a coral reef. And these are some of the things that we like to explore through uh, the art and the films that we make. But uh, I want to kind of start off with um, some words uh, by the president of the Knight Foundation, Alberto Ibarguen, <coughs> from a 2015 film called, called Coral City, um, which was a documentary about our work that really kind of, I think, speaks to his, his vision of, of connecting all of these different fields and really kind of the, the importance of, of Miami in this global conversation. 75% of people who live here were born someplace else, about 50% born in another country. We need connectors. Artists reflect what's happening to them, and they'll reflect the air and the water around us, and they'll reflect the changes in the society all around us. So I, I believe art will increasingly reflect what is happening in nature. Coral morphologic, I think, just happens to be a little bit ahead of the pack. So those are some very, very uh, kind words from, from Alberto, and, and truly we're, we're grateful for his support, and really um, everyone should also be grateful for, you know, for the Knight Foundation having the, having the vision to put on this event uh, in, in, in the first place, because you know, this is a conversation that is you know, that was eight years ago, um, and it's sort of, his words are, are, are more important now than, than ever. So just to give you a quick background, uh, I'm co-founder of Core Morphologic. Um, uh, I've founded it with um, my best friend since middle school, um, Jared McKay, he's a musician. Um, and here we are in our uh, Volcom collaboration clothes. Looks like I got the same shirt on here. Um, but we've been doing this for almost 15 years now. So we're, we're, we're really a, a very much DIY grassroots uh, um, endeavor and so you know what is what is coral morphologic? It, I know it's a mouthful. Uh, sometimes people have a hard times even pronouncing it. But uh, I would say today we describe it as a, it's a multimedia effort inducing human coral symbiosis through science, technology, and art in an attempt to catalyze a collective paradigm shift in our understanding of life on Earth and awareness of the micro and macro cosmos. So you know coral is sort of this really amazing, magical, alien uh, life form that connects the, the microscope to the telescope, you know, which are really kind of the, um, the archetypal tools of, of science. And, but, you know, it starts with, with, with attracting people in with just the simple aesthetic beauty of the coral, because, you know, many people don't even know what coral is. Is it a plant? Is it an animal? Is it a rock? Um, you know, it, it's an animal, but it has, it has components of all three of those things. Um, and, you know, trying to build empathy between a creature that doesn't have a face or a brain, it's not cute and cuddly like a panda bear, um, requires a, a little bit of, 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 of extra work. But fortunately for us as storytellers, you know, the coral does a lot of the hard work for us, starting with the fact that they're just so incredibly beautiful and some of the most fluorescent life forms on Earth. And so it, it's constantly reminding us to, to, to take a step back and remind us where we are. You know, we are on this, on this planet Earth. We have our one amazing moon that keeps our tides uh, in sync. You know, we have uh, basically we're living on a clock. Um, the moon and the, and the, the cycles of the sun um, are constantly reminding us of that. And corals were the first timekeepers uh, of, of planet Earth because they're cemented in place. And the only way that they can reproduce with each, each other is by synchronizing their entire lives around this cosmic movement. Um, so such a beautiful place that we live. Um, and it's here we are, we need to sort of zoom down to where we are here, which is at the southeastern tip of Florida, which itself is a very unique peninsula, uh, limestone origin. It's been underwater multiple times um, and out of water. The sea level rises, it falls. Um, and these are all things that we need to be aware of, of even being here. People tend to think of Miami as a tropical city, but you know, we have to sometimes remind ourselves it's actually a subtropical city, but we have a lot of a tropical life here because we have one of the most powerful oceanic currents on the whole planet, uh, just a couple miles off of our shoreline. Um, and so again, you know, these are things that, that we, we constantly need to, to keep in mind. And then Miami itself, um, you know, when you take a look at it from, from Google Earth or from outer space, I mean, you can just see how developed it is. Um, you know, it's, it, it is a, an example of terraforming. We, 
you know, had to drain the, the Everglades uh, to even make the, the, the real estate possible here. And many of the, um, you know, the most valuable real estate in Miami um, are on islands that have literally been dredged out of the muck itself. Um, Star Island and, and much of Miami Beach um, and, and the port of Miami have, have, have all been created by humans uh, really within the last 100 years. Um, but we have, you know, in order to get to, the, to Miami, it's a port city, um, you know, and coral reefs uh, are, are, have long been problematic for seafarers. Um, you know, 100 years ago, the idea of a coral reef was, was probably more terrifying than it was, um, you know, inspiring or, or a place that you would, you would go to enjoy yourself. Uh, you know, lots of shipwrecks in, in South Florida. Um, so in order to even get to the city, we had to create a way in, which now is enabling this ocean water from the, um, the Gulf Stream to bring with all of the life um, on every incoming tide. <clears throat> so here's a picture from a little over 100 years ago. You can see Port Miami is missing from this, from this picture. Um, it's not even there yet. So it goes to show just how much has changed within a really relatively short amount of time, which again, corals are great at reminding us that our human sense of time is perhaps a little bit uh, self-centered. Um, and if, you're, if you walk around Miami, you'll see just how much coral is represented here. Um, you know, Coral Gables uh, is, is named Coral Gables for the, the limestone, the keystone that, that is used in a lot of the architecture. And we have the wonderful courthouse in downtown Miami, which I think is one of the largest coral buildings, facade buildings in, in the world. Um, South Point Park, if you have a chance to, you know, go to South Point Park, really amazing walkway with, with this um, with this coral fossils. So it's sort of like we can look back through time. We have this geology around us um, to remind us of where we were and where we're headed. Um, and so, you know, as an artist, we try to try to like remind people about what we're, you know, about this past, the present, and the future. So by projecting corals onto these buildings, which are sort of analogous to, to a coral on a coral reef, you know, with housing all of this life and all of this diversity, um, you know, it sort of it, it speaks to um, those similarities, but it's also a reminder of that with sea level rise, you know, all of this infrastructure that we've built out of cement, which is itself recycled from uh, marine origin, um, will become a, an artificial reef if we don't um, do more to limit uh, global warming and sea level rise. Um, and so one of the projects that I'm, I'm most proud of that we've done over the last couple of years is called the Coral City Camera. Um, it's at the easternmost, port, um, easternmost point of Port Miami. Um, which, you can, which you can see here out at the, the pilot's house. All those rocks that you see were only put there um, a decade ago in 2011. So all of the marine life um, that, is, that is there you see on the camera, uh, which you can see here, um, has all, for the most part, uh, pioneered and self-recruited um, to, to the Coral City camera naturally. So this is what you see. You can tune into it 24-7. Uh, this is looking, looking up, up those rocks. These are these rocks that have now been colonized by coral and marine life. We've seen 180 species of fish now over the past two years, which is remarkable. Um, I was, you know, blew, blew my mind. Uh, never expected that we would wind up seeing that much um, marine life. And, you know, to, to see the sharks and to see the manatees um, and all of these fish is, is, is really, you know, a reminder of just what a special place that Miami is, that we have this biodiversity uh, living, living amongst us. Um, and so one of the things that uh, we, we've been working with scientists from the University of Miami where we're transplanting corals to this port site, we're taking endangered, they've taken uh, endangered staghorn corals. Uh, Rescue Reef is a really great program because um, we're trying to basically find the most resilient strains of coral that can then be utilized for restoration purposes. So if, you, if they can survive at the port, you know, where we have every outgoing tide bringing all of the, you know, the runoff from the city, um, and all of the bacteria and the water and the nutrients, if it can survive there, then you know, that, that's almost like it's a, um, a living laboratory to create these tough super corals. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a time lapse of the corals that were transplanted there at the end of June of last year. You can see that initially there was, there was a die off. They didn't, um, you know, that it was, it was difficult for them to, to adapt. But then over the course of the year, little by little, you start seeing that these corals have, have adapted um, and we're in the process of, of sort of looking at the microbiome of these corals to, to see, you know, what, what has changed in them to be able to have, have survived this. Um, and so the last uh, slide that, I, that I'll, sh I'll show here is, um, is a, 
an excerpt from a film that I filmed at Port of Miami at night um, of these corals, um, just to show just how fluorescent and, and alien these creatures that we have right in our own backyard are. Um, and the full film will be playing at the Wallcast, uh, at the Soundscape Park um, across the street at the New World Center uh, tonight and tomorrow night, if you haven't already seen it. Um, but, you know, it, it's a reminder that the, the original neon life forms, the nightlife creatures of Miami were, were and still are coral. Um, and that you don't have to go halfway around the world to find, uh, you know, these, these alien creatures living amongst us. So, um, so that's my little introduction of, 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 of what I do. And i um, happy to pass it over to, to Swati, yeah. who can show you a little bit more about uh, her amazing work. Fantastic. Yeah, Thanks, Colin. Um, Please. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's great to be here. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, um, Aspen Institute for the event and for everyone to be here to share so many ideas. Um, so I'll just do a quick run through. So the Sea Change Project um, is essentially a not-for-profit. Uh, we're based in Cape Town. And we work on towards the long-term conservation of the great African sea forest. So our, um, the way we do it is we tell stories, science-based storytelling, and we inspire people to reimagine their connection to nature, um, wherever you might be, to make a conscious connection to the biosphere that you're a part of as the human animal. So our tagline uh, for Sea Change Project is, remember, you are wild. So, um, so I'm going to start with, as you can see, this first slide. This is um, the Great African Sea Forest. Um, it's literally a forest um, under the water. Uh, the kelp is a three-dimensional structure. It has a hole fast, as you can see. It's on, um, you know, it, it, it on a rocky substrate. So you won't find kelp on sandy beds in the ocean. It's a rocky substrate. It requires to fix itself on the rocky substrate. It has a hole fast, not roots. Um, it's got these hollow stripes that are filled with air, and then it reaches out for the sun. The fronds are on the surface. Uh, they're like blades, and they, you know, uh, filter feed, and they capture sunlight, photosynthesize, you know, uh, to, like, grow. So in this three-dimensional structure, this forest basically forms a shelter, a feeding ground, and a nursery for a whole host of animals. Um, so in South Africa, uh, our, in the tip of where we are, at Cape Town, um, some of our forests are some of the most biodiverse places the ocean actually has. Um, of the species that have been recorded, um, about 30% are endemic, which means you only find them there and nowhere else. Um, so it's, it's very magical when you dive in this forest. And uh, for those of you who have watched the film, you know that those of us who work for the Sea Change Project, uh, we dive in this uh, environment every single day. Uh, no wetsuit, no real scuba gear, it's free diving. Uh, because as I said, you know, being the human animal, this, you want to be in that space just like any other organism in the water. And also in this environment, um, it's, it's beautiful to scuba. It's not like you can't scuba, people don't scuba. But when you go in to do a free dive, uh, the experiences that you have, what you see, uh, because the animals are quite shy, they're quite cryptic, you have to do a lot of tracking to like find them. Uh, it's pretty spectacular. So the thing about the kelp forest is that it, uh, so you find kelp forests in about a fourth, so about 25% of the world's coastlines have kelp forests. So that's temperate zones not tropical, not subtropical, I'm talking about cool water. So that's 25% of the world's coastlines have coral, um, have uh, kelp forests. It's an actual forest under the water. So per acre, some of the forests um, sequester 10 times more carbon than tropical forests on land. Um, where, we, where I live, some of the areas of the forest have 10 times more biomass per square kilometer than the Serengeti. So if you think of the big animals in the Serengeti, and then you think of the small animals in the kelp forest, then think of the amount of biomass it takes uh, to actually make up, to have 10 times the amount of biomass in some of the patches that have been studied. So it's incredibly, incredibly uh, crucial, important um, ecosystem. Um, anemones, these are strawberry anemones, these beautiful, beautiful creatures everywhere. And all of you will recognize her. That's the octopus from my octopus teacher. And so. Um, when we started out as the Sea Change Project, we realized that living in Cape Town and people in and around South Africa 
really did not know too much about this ecosystem. Many people didn't even realize that this was such an extensive ecosystem because from the surface, all you see is some brown looking fronds at low tide on the surface. It's only when you enter the water and you go in, you realize there's this extensive forest off the sea in the water. So we wanted to put the great African sea forest on the global map and that we did uh, with the firm and thanks to her. And that's a baby octopus. Um, you find many of them in, in the forest, in like little dens. Um, these are jellyfish that come in when the waters get a bit warmer. The thing with um, kelp forests is um, coral reefs, corals are probably the most vulnerable to rising temperatures and to warming waters. Kelp forest is the second most vulnerable ecosystem to rising um, heat and, and, and rising temperatures. Um, as I said, many of our animals are endemic. This is a tuberculate cuttlefish. This is a spotted gully shark. Um, that's a leopard cat shark, puff adder shy shark, pajama cat shark, which you'll recognize from the film as well, shy, uh, dark shy shark, um, again, a spotted gully shark. So 30%, as I said, of the animals of the species that have been described so far, 30% of them are endemic. So that's a pretty high level of endemism for, for an ecosystem um, on the coast. And I just want to say along with corals and kelp forests and mangroves and seagrass and dune ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, if you really look at kelp forests and seagrass and corals and all of it, might not occupy a big area in the ocean, even if their distribution might be sort of worldwide, the area they occupy is between, I guess, 0.3 to maybe 0.4% of the actual ocean. But they kind of host about one fourth of the biodiversity of the entire ocean. So if you think about the oceans and you think about how little of a space these coastal near shore ecosystems occupy and for the amount of biodiversity they house, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. But these are also the ecosystems that take the maximum amount of pressure because this is where the human impact and human activity really comes into making. And this is a short tailed stingray. I think of them like as elephants underwater, extraordinary animals. Um, and this is, yes, yeah, so we called our kelp forest the Great African Sea Forest because we realized that when you have a space next to you that is a beautiful environmental ecological space, often if you just say kelp forest, it doesn't have enough character for people to actually relate, for people to be able to connect emotionally for people to be able to make that conscious connection, we named it. Once you name it, it has an identity. Once it has an identity, it speaks for itself. Once it speaks for itself, you connect. And once you connect, you love. And that's really uh, where we take it. We get um, humpback whales coming into the forest. This is a juvenile humpback who, you know, uh, who had come in to feed. What's extraordinary about this, uh, every time I see a humpback, what I'm reminded of is what we are capable of of doing when we put our minds to something. Just even 40, 50 years ago, we had decimated humpback populations down to just a, a couple of hundred or a few thousand across the world because of whaling. When the whaling ban was put into place and humpbacks were allowed to come back, today they're back to 93% of their original numbers. And that is an extraordinary recovery for an enormous mammal like a humpback whale. So every time I see the humpback whale, it's this enormous injection of hope because I, if we give these ecosystems the time they require to thrive, to recover, to regenerate, it's extraordinary how, um, how they bounce back. Uh, that's a, you know, the southern right whale just in the kelp forest. It's so huge that you can literally only see it. In, in sections. You can't actually see the whole animal unless I swim way away till I get a photograph, in which case it will be difficult to film it in the forest. Um, as I said, we at Sea Change, we're in the ocean every single day. Um, we swim every single day, we dive every single day, because the way we tell stories, which are science-based for Sea Change, is embodied activism and embodied experience. So we will not tell a story. We will not talk about a single organism in the kelp forest. I will not talk to you about the kelp forest unless I am in it myself every single day, experiencing the wonder, the joy, the inspiration that it is for me. And hopefully when I describe it or tell those stories, um, it inspires and brings joy 
to people listening and inspires them to make a connection to whatever part of nature they want to make a connection to. It doesn't necessarily have to be the ocean. Um, if you're in the middle of a city, it could be a tree you walk by every day, um, a park that you spend time in, but a conscious connection. Um, and yeah, as this is basically, you know, just, I love just being in the water. Just three years ago, I actually started getting into the water only three years ago. I had a near drowning incident as a child. I was terrified of the ocean and terrified of water. And then as fate, irony, I don't know, the universe having a good laugh would have it. I met Craig, um, you know, he's my partner and we got married and he's like, he's happier in water than he's on land. So this was, mystifying for me because I just couldn't access the water for the longest time. But in the last three years, I call it turning my fear to wonder. And the Skelp Forest, the Great African Sea Forest helped me do that. And now I'm in the water every single day. The other extraordinary thing about this particular coast in Africa is that um, this is the coast of the birth of the modern human mind, which is we call the, what we are today. You know, we are the modern human. So about 150,000 to 200,000 years ago is when we made that leap in consciousness that made us the modern human as we recognize ourselves today. So there are caves all along our coast. Um, and there's paleoarchaeology that's been done. There's DNA tests that's being done. High science from the Sapiens Institute, which is based in Norway. Um, dozens and dozens of archaeologists, paleoscientists, paleoarchaeologists, um, all of them studying these caves. Um, and what they have found is the oldest art on Earth, the oldest chemistry kit on Earth, the oldest jewelry on Earth. And when I say the oldest art on Earth, it's a little tiny piece of ochre on which there's an etching. And why that is so extraordinary is because that was the first time the human animal, whoever that person was, had an image or a thought in their mind and they took it out of their mind and put it on something as a symbolic representation. That symbolic representation forms the basis for all our symbolic culture today. Everything that we do from social media to getting onto our computers to speaking to each other to language to how we tell stories to how we dress to how we represent each other. That symboling that we do is that is where it all originated, and that's what defines us in many ways as the modern human. And that, to me, is fascinating because it feels like the home and the origin of storytelling. And it's from this coast that about 60,000 years ago, there were a few incursions before but weren't that successful, but it's from that coast 60,000 years ago that people moved out of Africa into the rest of the world. So when people come to the that part of Cape Town, we usually tell them, welcome home, because we are all under the skin, in our DNA, deep in our past with our ancestors, we are all from Africa, this part of the coast of Africa. This is where we've had a 6,000 generation unbroken pact with the wild. So this is also part of why Sea Change believes in bringing this into part of our stories, talking about why the ocean is so important, and, and as I'm sure Barton will tell more about how feeding off the ocean, you know, like the people who lived at the time, the whale fat that they consumed, the shellfish that they consumed, uh, the limpets and all of the rest of the food that they consumed helped engine, you know, power that engine, which was the brain that helped us become the modern humans. So I'm just gonna hand over awesome. to Barton, yeah. I should just leave, this is great. You guys can keep. I'm, I'm done. We're... That's when you drop the mic. Yeah, so. Hey everyone, I'm really thrilled to be back with you and, and what an awesome panel, so thank you so much for this. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna talk, I guess, sort of coming back to the idea of solutions. Um, you know, what you're describing is rather Edenic and in some ways we have cast ourselves from Eden by forgetting our relationship with the oceans. Um, and you know, as you mentioned, it was the oysters, it was the clams, it was the mussels, it was those things, the omega-3s, which really drove the development of our brains. It freed up that, that developmental capacity, then the harnessing of fire, and, and those were sort of the elements from which uh, we drew our inimitable power. Uh, so ocean as a climate solution, as a climate hero, I'm gonna talk about a little bit why I came to be consider myself a seafood evangelist, uh, and that is really looking at seafood 
or more so looking at the oceans and our relationship to the oceans through the very intimate act of feeding ourselves, taking the world into our bodies, and using seafood as that connection back to the 99% of the biosphere. 99% of a livable space on this planet is underwater. 70% plus of the surface of this planet is water. You know, Sylvia Earle says, why, why is it called planet Earth when it's really planet water? And there's a very real and deep truth to that. So my history with seafood started out with a uh, Yule Gibbons book uh, called Stalking the, Wild Sca the Blue-Eyed Scallop and uh, trips down to the Patuxent River in the Chesapeake, a tributary of. And uh, well, I was one of those little boys in a tide pool that always wondered what delicious, what tasty was underfoot. And that um, sort of propelled my career in understanding the power of food. I lived in an immigrant community largely uh, comprised of people fleeing civil unrest in their own na home nations. And so that power of food to draw together, to bring us together, to describe, to express, to define even ourselves uh, has just been a very powerful motivator for me. And I see that power of food now as a means for us to translate our past into our future in the same way that those immigrant communities showed me they could in their new communities. So, this country, settler America, was founded upon the backs of cod. You know, that's why white people ended up here. It was to fish the bounty of these waters. And when they got here, what they discovered was a bounty that had really never been touched before offshore. And what was inshore was a bounty that had sustained indigenous peoples in sustainably for t since time immemorial. There's recent been uh, some recent papers suggesting evidence that shows that uh, shellfish middens uh, provide evidence that we have, well, we indigenous peoples have harvested uh, shellfish along these along our shores here sustainably at rates higher than capitalist uh, sort of colonialist fisheries exploitation at rates higher than what we have done in the past 200 years, and they were able to be sustained consistently throughout 10,000 years. The highest point in southern Florida is, in fact, a mountain of oyster shells. If that doesn't describe the, in the integrity and just the importance of that here. But I think one of the things that we've forgotten is that connection to the oceans. And the fact that, as I mentioned, settler America was founded upon the backs of cod and the men and women who braved these seas to fish for them. But once we got here, the agrarian notion took over. And we traded, we sort of turned away from, from the tempestuous waves of the North Atlantic and faced a different ocean, one that rippled with amber waves of grain. And the reason for this is in the agrarian notion, private, privatization, land ownership is the surest form of political stability and prosperity. And so we turned this great commons into the privates. And that sort of marked our separation or sort of our casting away from Eden in this way. And over the course of those years, we have exploited those fisheries. We have created irrational economies that are based just on extraction rather than a real partnership with. And what we've forsaken is these socio-ecological systems, which the indigenous peoples had sort of so uh, well executed for so long. And a socio-ecological system is one in which maybe an entire watershed is seen as the balance of relationships, of a culture and cultural expectations of each other. It's seen through a conservation ethic and it's seen through the lens of our ancestors and our future. All of these resources seen as part of a whole rather than niches of capitalist extraction. And when we look at our systems this way, we begin to see these holistic ecosystem approaches. But what we've done with seafood is we haven't thought about it that way. And even when we talk about sustainable seafood, we're looking at it through such the microcosm of the acute lens of is this fish biologically sustained or not, rather than the way that we use that product, which in Western countries is center of the plate. And I spoke about this yesterday. When we look at sustainability of any food product, we have to look at how we use it, what else is on the plate, and also the purpose by which we use it for what we use it for. Dinner is, in fact, to sustain our bodies first and foremost, then to entertain and bring us together. So when we look at seafood in this larger paradigm, 
it begins to look pretty good against other center of the plate proteins, beef, pork, chicken, lamb, veal, turkey. And as I mentioned last night, we eat about 200 pounds per person of those per year. We eat about 16 to 18 pounds of seafood per person per year. And basically, we need to rationalize our diet. And as we begin to look at sustainable diet solutions, the ocean begins to look very good. And we begin to look to our past for inspiration and guidance on how we can sustainably fish. You know, before white man found gold on these countries, you had to look through the salmon. There were so many of them. This can be done, we can sustain not only wild fisheries, but really what's exciting to me is the advent of aquaculture. Though it has been practiced for 5,000 years in various parts of the world, as a commercial industry, it's only about 60 years old. The pace of learning and the scope of potential there we know now how to sustainably farm our oceans in ways that are socio-ecologically oriented. And when we look at this, there's a paper by Dr. Haley Froelich out of the UCAL system. It says, if we were to farm intensively and sustainably an area of our ocean the size of Lake Michigan, we could produce current to equal the total wild capture, 90 million metric tons every year, sustainably and intensively in an area of the ocean the size of Lake Michigan which is less than one one-thousandth of a percent of the ocean. The number of jobs that can be created is immense. And by the way, about 70 plus percent of people employed in aquaculture globally are women. And as we all know, if you want to solve the world's problems, empower women, support women, create economic opportunity, it's, it's all there. And aquaculture provides actually a direct means to invest and to create opportunity. Why? because this is a new system that doesn't displace a traditional male workforce. However ridiculous that is, that's the, re you know, that's the reality of it. So when I look at the oceans as a climate solution, as a climate hero, I see ourselves having the opportunity to look to our past, to learn from, and to mimic, and to include and participate with indigenous peoples to learn how we can continue to expand into the ocean, to reduce our footprint, to sustain people, and to create economic opportunity and delicious storytelling that brings us back to sort of the Christian ethic or the idea of that Edenic opportunity to live and sustain in a place where we want to be. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you all for those incredibly inspirational overviews of, of why the ocean is so integral to what we do, even though so few people talk about it in the way it needs to be talked about. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Nancy Pelosi said on, what was that? I'm losing track of my days. Monday night, Nancy Pelosi and opened this conference and one of the last things she said on this stage was, the arts will save us. And you are all artists of one stripe or another. Um, and art is how we tell our stories. And this is a panel about storytelling and it's a panel about how we um, tell the stories of the ocean to solve the problems that we're facing. So I, my first question for you all, and probably the last one before I turn it over to the audience for questions, is how is your art contributing to this and how is your art going to save us? And I'll throw it open. Who wants to go first? Well, I think that's a, that's a, it's a really great question. And I think it comes back to, you know, I, my journey starts as someone interested in science. Um, and studying science and there are, there are tools of science. And we also have to think about, you know, to me, science is sort of the pursuit of an objective truth, something that can be you know, proven um, and repeatedly, um, no matter who does it or how you, how you do it, it's, it's, it's sort of the pursuit of the, of, of the objective. And art is sort of is more the pursuit of the subjective. You know, this is where our imagination can, can take us. And at least for me, as um, you know, someone who's sort of more pivoted to you know, utilizing, when you think about the camera, or a video you know, camera, we're using lenses and glass. And this is really you know, the, the, the tool of the, of the scientist um, you know, documenting life, um, you know, what, what, it, what the octopus is doing in, in the kelp, uh, what are the corals doing. You know, the, these, these are important tools to objectively understand the world around us. Um, you know, and we have the microscope and we have the telescope. They're all, they're all related to um, you know, this ability to zoom in and zoom out. Um, and I'm always thinking about um, the Eames uh, film, Powers of Ten, and how sort of 
you know, that's a, a way to, 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 to see things, not on a linear scale, but like on this logarithmic scale of moving out and moving, zooming in and zooming out. And for me, you know, I had this moment when um, I was in, still in school where I, I realized that, you know, to continue on this path of academia, I might wind up becoming an expert in just a very small um, patch of, of, of territory. But, you know, if, if I'm not able to communicate the degree to which this is important or why people should, should, should care about what it is that I'm studying, you know, what good does it do without the tools to be able to explain this? And this is where you know, the objective and the subjective, because of course you know, the last thing that I want to do as a scientist is through my storytelling, you know, um, portray things that aren't objective, that aren't, that aren't real, you know, because there is so much misinformation right now. In fact, I would say this is perhaps one of the greatest concerns of, of the future is, is trying to identify what's real and what's not real um, and what's truth and what's not truth. Um, so, you know, for, for me, um, you know, it's a, to be able to use both of these tools, the camera, you know, to, to portray, use it as a, as a tool of the objective, but then it also as a, as a storytelling uh, tool to be able to create these, these ideas and emotions and connections, which uh, in many cases are subjective experiences for people. Thanks. Um, Swati, you're a filmmaker, you're a journalist, you're, you know, in your form of storytelling. Yeah, so I think, I mean, we all know that as, the, as who we are, we are hardwired to respond and listen to stories. I mean, study after study has shown that the decision-making process, as logical, as scientific, as wonderfully rational as a lot of us might think ourselves to be, it's a very small surface area of the brain that actually, you know, responds to facts most of our decision making comes from emotion. Even if we want to deny it, that's just how we are wired. So storytelling is absolutely intrinsic to everything that we do. And I'm not just talking about a movie that we make. Everything that we tell ourselves in this room from every system that we've created as humans, be it politics, be it the economic system, be it religion, be it anything, it's a story we have told each other, it's a story we've told each other, it's a story we've told ourselves. When I sit here and introduce myself to you, it's a story. I'm telling you a story about myself. When we have a conversation um, about things that make us do things or not, it's a belief system you and I have, that's a story. That is a story that we've told ourselves about ourselves. So everything that we do is a story. So that is why the power of being able to connect from that medium is so incredibly important. So when it comes to, and as um, Colin said, what we try and do, obviously, when it comes to things like ocean and natural history and the animals in the ocean and everything that's happening, it has to be science-based. You're not, you know, you're not going to lie. It's not like something you're going to invent. It's not something that you're trying to, you know, create when it doesn't exist. No, it has to be fact-based, and it's based in science, at least with the Sea Change Project. When we tell stories, that's key. But still, how do you take that and express it in a way that it gets to emotions? And I know this is an incredibly cliched thing to say. Because you know, today we're looking for innovative ideas, we're looking at you know, moon shots, we're looking at silver bullets, we're looking at these greatly you know, out of the box way of doing things. And for me, fundamentally, there is one thing that has always made a difference. And as cliched as it sounds, it's how we love. What we do as humans, everything that we do as humans, everything that we will fight for, protect, and altruistically, I mean, when, you, when we love as humans, we will want whatever it is that we love to thrive regardless of a return benefit. Half the problem in the conservation conversation and half the problem with the way we look at this planet is we're permanently talking about, oh, you know, you've got to do this to save this because that's what it gives us. Oh, you've got to save this ecosystem because these are the ecosystem services. Oh, we've got to like, do this thing because this is what we get. Those are all facts, very important facts. No one's denying those facts, but it becomes very transactional. And as humans, our greatest inspiration and the greatest way we make a difference comes from what we love, sometimes almost irrationally. And that, to me, is where the power of storytelling comes in. How can I talk to people about something that's happening that they can see, but how do I put it in words that they will feel? You know, and that to me is like absolutely key. So even when it comes to nature connection, a lot of us will go out 
We'll take a walk. We love being in a park. We might go for a swim. We might go for a hike up a mountain. How many of us are connecting consciously? It's one thing to be out in nature, and it's another thing to let nature come into you. And that's where the power of storytelling works for yourself, for the stories that you listen to. And the reason I say that is because you go back, and I, again, go back to um, indigenous wisdoms, indigenous ways of life. I mean, the first biggest tragedy is that there's been a massive epistemicide, you know, this, this, this killing of indigenous knowledge and indigenous way of life that we've done. Because at some level, when science took over in this very rigid, empirical way of having to prove things over and over and everything has to make sense and two plus two must add up to four, we dismissed indigenous knowledge as just myth or fiction you know, as, as things that don't matter. In fact, we went far enough in that dismissal to even see it as primitive. When frankly, for, as I said, when you look, at, when you look back onto the human being on this planet, it was, we had an 80, from 150,000 years, and of course, million years before when we became whatever it was, the human-like species too, but from the modern human, if you look at our history as hunter-gatherers, we had, close to a 150,000 year sustainable way of living on this planet until we hit a wall with agriculture. And then it all changed. So that indigenous knowledge, why it's so important is because of the beautiful way, the same thing that we talk about, they tell stories. As a quick, small example, when you speak to the San people in South Africa, they will talk about connection. So say you step out of your room one morning and you see a little bird. In that action of seeing the bird, the bird has seen you. Maybe you never do that again and that thing ends. But let's say that you step out the next day and you see a bird and the bird sees you. A small thread forms between you and that bird. Then you consciously step out every morning to look for that bird. Now that thread is getting stronger and stronger. When you're looking at that bird and you're looking at everything that that bird is doing, you're noticing what tree is it sitting on? What is it eating? What are the sounds that it's making? What is it nervous of? What's the other bird that might eat this little bird? When does it nest? When does it have its babies? And in doing that, you're noticing so many other things around that bird and these threads are forming from you to all of that that you're noticing because everything that you're noticing is sentient. And that sentience has noticed you. So threads are forming back from that sentience towards you. And if you do this consciously every day and you connect to what's happening, these threads become ropes. And this is what the San people call the ropes to God. And this, if you extrapolate from that, is how they describe the web of life. What science calls the web of life, this is how the indigenous people see the web of life. The difference is science separates us and gives us that objective thing where we step back and we look at it. But in indigenous wisdom, you are the center of it as the human animal. You're part of that web and it feeds to you and you feed to it. So that to me is the power of storytelling and why it's so, so crucial. Because there are a lot of stories we're being told about how material things make you happy, how consuming makes you happy, how growth, growth, growth should make you happy, how getting out there and making money should make you happy. We need stories to tell us that there's so much more to the human psyche, the human spirit, the human soul, that is just being ignored, being not fed with this disconnection we have with nature. How do we bring that back? How do we bring that love back? Because that will heal our souls, our spirit, and hopefully that means a paradigm shift which will help heal the wounds that we've created on this living biosphere that we call home. So while science tells us why we should do something, storytelling makes us want to do it. Bart, I'll, do you want to... I'll, I'll type in quickly, where do we tell ourselves, where do we tell our stories most often? It's around the dinner table, right? That's where we meet. Stories were originally told around the fire. The fire was used to cook. That was where sort of humanity became human. Sort of, or, or humans became, really grew our humanity. And so that story there is, I, I think, so important. And to me, the, the, the concepts of sustainability and are really, really complicated. The science of it, notwithstanding what somebody has just so eloquently said, is so complicated. But the action of sustainability is really very simple, and that's of being a good neighbor, right? I mean, if, if, if I'm looking out for you, if I care about you, then our ripples are far wider than if we're self-centered. And where do we be good neighbors? around the table. So that's where my art comes in. Amazing, thanks. Um, I, I can't believe we only have 10 minutes left. Um, this has flown by. 
Uh, questions from the audience? Let's see who we got. Yes, right here in the towards the back. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm with the Everglades Foundation, and uh, one lesson that I've learned is that wh wherever there's a problem, there's someone benefiting from it. Uh, and clearly, with you know, with the Everglades Foundation, it's the sugar industry, agriculture, that has put all this phosphorus and taken away all our fresh water. I'd be curious to hear from the th three panelists who is benefiting the most from the problems that you see in your particular areas with the ocean. Great question. Who wants to kick that one off? Uh, white people. <laughs> uh, so 80% of the world's catch in wild capture is coming from 20% of the fleet and vice versa. So 80% of the fishers in the world are catching 20% of the fish, and that's just wild capture. Uh, and so there's a great consolidation of that resource wealth and the extraction from it, uh, whereas our dependence and our ability to depend upon micro-ecosystems and regional ecosystems has really been depleted by a globalized system of trade around seafood. I live in Maine. I witnessed this firsthand with lobsters. Um, it is a highly regional, highly focused fishery that has a global perspective to it. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I really see aquaculture as being an antidote to this. And not all forms of aquaculture. It takes $10 million to put one salmon net pen farm in the water. It takes about $2,000 to become a kelp farmer in Maine. Uh, if you have a boat and you're already you know, part of that community, et cetera. So there are some radically different scales here. And I think uh, the Slow Fish Organization is really doing a, a great job at sort of elucidating uh, some of those differences and the pathways we have towards supporting those markets as individuals. Um, not with spending necessarily even more money, but really supporting uh, localized systems, socio-ecological systems, in the same way we do when we go to f shop at farmer's markets. Um, and so that that's where I really find good faith in, in this, and 84% of aquaculture happens in Asia. Uh, it can happen in just about any coastline, anywhere over the world, um, and there's uh, increasingly more effort and innovation in uh, spreading, sort of not the gospel of aquaculture, but the can-do of aquaculture around, so. Great. So what do you want to go? Yeah, um, I guess kelp has become the new buzzword around the world. Um, even though we know very little about the various kelp ecosystems, not one kelp ecosystem is like the other. It just like any other ecosystem, it just varies and drastically so. Um, and as I, as Barton said, sh there are many many solutions, and you know, with aquaculture and stuff that's coming up. But like in a country like South Africa, and I'm very specific because I can't comment to anything outside of that. Uh, we have complicated political system. We have the scar of apartheid that's, you know, barely 20 years, 25 years since um, that ended. There's been a massive separation of people from uh, the ocean. The people who now fish in the ocean, a lot of it is crony capitalism. It's really not the original communities that know the ocean and know the fish and know the waters. It's licenses given to cousins and brothers-in-laws and, you know, wives and daughters um, around the country who don't know how to do it, and it's, it's a bit of a mess. Um, and I guess uh, when it comes to the ocean in general, one of the biggest problems is when the ocean was seen as a resource, um, one of the big reasons it was seen as a resource was because it was seen as an infinite resource. The whole predication of fisheries was on this endless bounty that the ocean was producing. It doesn't produce an endless bounty. It can be a wonderful bounty, but it's not an endless bounty, but that was how the whole system was predicated, which the foundation of it is all wrong. So no wonder where, you know, where we are at today with everything that's happened. So this kind of thing in terms of you know, the ocean, looking at the ocean for a long time, not paying attention to the ocean, and I think Michael might have mentioned this in the entire I don't know how many hundred pages of the COP agreement that was written last year, the ocean was mentioned exactly once. You know, so, and at 70%, it controls our climate system and everything. So this kind of thing I see a lot. And I think um, in terms of knowing enough about the ocean, it's, it's, we know very little, especially the benthic layer, for example. We've mapped more of the moon and Mars than we have of the ocean, you know, the seabed, the ocean seabed. So we know so little. So. From that perspective, I guess, you know, it, it's easy for me 
to step back and as a conservationist and with a certain kind of life to go, that person is exploiting this or that. So it's not to point fingers. It's just, I just want everything to be done in a, I guess, in a space of more compassion, thinking about what the long-term effects are, what it might mean, um, more involvement, 100% of local communities and indigenous communities, because again, if this whole thing, these wonderful solutions go back into the hands of the same corporates that have caused the problems in the first place, it's kind of like Einstein's paradigm, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome, the definition of insanity, so. Colin, you want to touch on this briefly? And yeah, take sure. Take time for one more after. Um, you know, I, I think something that I'm confronted with a lot, and it's come up in this conversation up here, is you know, the ocean and these and these ecosystems always seem to be, even from the people that are trying to promote and protect, you know, it's all, there's always some sort of financial reason we must protect the ocean because it provides fisheries and ecotourism, and and this is why we need to save coral reefs. And that always kind of, you know, it, it rubs me the wrong way. And I think right now we're seeing, you know, right now we're talking about buzzwords, you know, uh, carbon offsets, blue carbon, like all of these things that I think we're, 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 we're seeing um, capitalists trying to appear as the heroes, um, that we can use capitalism. Um, you know, we're constantly surrounded by people that are saying, oh, you guys could do NFTs and, and you can, you know, use that money and, and, and sort of, you know, asking us to, to sort of, you know, jump in on this thing that's full of what I think is a lot of hype and really, you know, it's sort of building, building more infrastructure and creating more problems um, than actually getting to the root of the issue, um, which, again, we talk about up here, which is building personal connections between humans and the ecosystem in our biosphere and an empathy and love you know and to 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 quote jlo you know love doesn't cost a thing it's something that is infectious and this is of course this is a problem where our capitalist society breeds insecurity to make us feel less love um, and i think that as storytellers that's really our 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 job is to sort of build that connection and, and that mentioning sort of gathering around the, the the fire as being sort of this original social connection in this sort of the mystery of, of nature and um, you know the underwater camera that we have the Coral City camera in an interview with BBC last year I, I described it as like a digital campfire where we have people from all around the world that have never met each other and they're all just sort of staring in and watching like like Swati is saying you go every day outside you see that bird you know and then <clears throat> with the camera you have that si a very similar type of thing it's using technology I'm not against technology I think you know, new technological innovation, you know, to improve things like aquaculture, you know, to come up with, with new technology is important. I'm not saying that there isn't, um, you know, and that, that there's perhaps not ethical money to be made in this, but I think that the, the, to the pursuit of it, to be driven from a financial perspective is perhaps one of the, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very misdirected, um, way to look at, at, at the solution at the problem and I think that the solution really comes you know from 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 our hearts great thanks excellent sentiments there we have time so we have two minutes left on our clock so if there's a really quick question yes go ahead right here and then we'll do lightning round answers here so that we can get awesome. you all out of here to lunch hi guys I'm Daniel Kleinman I work with a local company called Seaworthy Collective we help co-create and grow startups in this space and I actually really appreciate kind of the last perspective you shared. Uh, Swati, you mentioned, you know, really moonshots and innovation kind of versus how we love. And I really kind of, in, in the work that we do, you know, I'm not a capitalist. I actually like to say we're trying to exploit capitalists for the environment rather than the other way around. Um, so I'm curious, how do we merge these solutions, emerging solutions that aren't just hype and, and you know, buzzwords, and really bridge that with storytelling to build empathy for solutions that can be scalable with not profit incentive, but really impact scalability incentive? All right, let's take 30 seconds a piece on this one. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a hard one. I think that's what we're all grappling with. Like, how do we, because we know we have, we have to do something because we know things are unraveling. And there are great ideas. And, and people who are committed, passionate, they have, you know, I'm not saying that people who have different ideas to me or people who have innovative ideas are all, oh, that's all rubbish. Absolutely not. Each person is playing to their strength. Each person is trying to see what they can do to, to make a difference, and it's coming from the right place. But I think maybe fundamentally, as, as Colin has said, and as Barton has said, it's just you know that concern for your neighbor, uh, compassion, making a connection. So whatever it is that we do to first 
put it, come from a place of empathy and compassion so then we don't just step out there and like business at all costs and profit at all costs. That attitude doesn't come back in into the way we're trying to save the planet, which caused the problem in the first place. I right. guess that's, yeah. Colin, solve environmentalism and capitalism in 30 seconds. I, w I wish I had such an easy answer. Um, you know, it seems like a lot of a lot of capitalism is is sort of and and, and real estate, especially in Miami, is uh, is you know the greater fool theory is constantly at work. Uh, you know, trying to trying to sell things, and I feel like if you've got uh, a, a room full of lesser fools and greater fools, you still have a room full of fools that are trying to sell them sell each other something, um, and and that so you know the idea of of. Of, of trying to leverage capitalism and take advantage of the capitalist to, to, to do better work with it. I'm just a bit skeptical of this idea that you're going to play somebody who literally is, you know, a professional poker player. Um, so I'm, I, I proceed with caution um, and cynicism when it, when, it, when it comes to this idea that, that we can sort of leverage, um, you know, major capital in a way that is going to... because. We need to change the paradigm. We need to change the way that we fundamentally see um, ourselves and our future, and not be so selfish, and and realize that basically we are we're just drawing off of the collective credit card, you know. And and for all of this uh, this idea of financial responsibility, we're just passing down the debt to future generations of our kids. And I think about these these people being born in the future. To be born on a planet with dead and dying coral reefs is not a place where mental health can really fully flourish in, our, in ourselves. And I imagine myself being born in that future and being very angry that all of the warning signs were there. We saw it coming. And yet to be born in a world where, where, where these actions, are, it's, it's in the past. You know, Now is really the last opportunity that we have. The warning signs are there. Um, we really need to just change the way that we, that, that we see ourselves because we are not above nature. Uh, we are a part of nature, um, and 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 when we recognize that sort of the, the 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 microbiome in our gut is actually sort of uh, you know we're all just sort of these meat puppets that are that that are, are you know our hunger where does our what are we feeding are we feeding ourselves are we feeding this community that lives on us and inside us you know these are these are the types of paradigm shifts that I think can really ground us literally you know to the dirt and the ground um, and the water all around us and 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 that's. You know, yeah, we just have to change. As storytellers, we just need to change this because the ocean is a soup, right? It's, it's, it's literally full of life. You just keep going down and you've got viruses and you've got bacteria. You have, you have all of this stuff, um, you know, that, that, we're all, that we're all a part of. And, and that's what inspires me. And, you know, some of our projects don't make money. And, and you know, I haven't been to a doctor in 10 years and I don't, have, I don't have health insurance. And, like, I have a hard time paying rent sometimes, but I don't do it for those reasons, um, you know, because at the end of the day, it's about the story, telling that story, and it's not about me either. You know, it's about the corals and letting the corals tell their story because they have something to teach us. They have been building cities for half a billion years. You know, what can we as sort of these, these modern city builders learn from all of this? You know, it's, it's not just, it's, it's the indigenous knowledge, but it's also the knowledge from nature itself, um, which can certainly help inform us as modern humans. I knew that wasn't a 30 second question. Sorry. That's all right. No, it was great stuff. Great stuff. All right, Bart, bring us home. Take us to lunch. I, I'll you send do. you off to lunch. Eat, uh, eat with joy. <laughs> Celebrate that you can continue to participate in the bounty of this, of this world. Eat with care and be mindful of the impact that your choices have on each other and yourself. And ultimately, please eat together to remind us of what unites all of us on this big, beautiful, and mostly blue planet. Thanks. Thank you. Lunchtime. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panelists. Great discussion.